from Jadavpur University, Kolkata, and the MA degree in Electrical Engineering, as well as PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He joined the faculty of the Department of Electrical Engineering, Jadavpur University, Kolkata, in July 1987, where he was a professor and has served as the head of the department. At present, he is a visiting professor with the same department, continuing PhD supervision. He is the Dean Academic of St. Thomas College of Engineering and Technology, Kolkata, and a professor of electrical engineering. His fields of interest are static power conversion, electrical drives, power semiconductor applications, magnetics, and applied electronics. He has been associated with several Government of India bodies and agencies as an expert in the area of academic quality improvement and power electronics related activities. He has also been associated as a consultant with several major industries in India to develop indigenous technologies in the area of power electronics and drives. Fellow of Institutions of Engineers India, a Fellow of Institutions of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineers India, and a Senior Member of Institution of Electrical and Electronics Engineers USA. He received several awards, amongst which are the Indian National Science Academy for Medal for Young Scientist and IETE Bimal Bose Award for Outstanding Contribution in the Field of Power Electronics. He is the chairman of IEEE IAS Kolkata chapter, past chairman of IEEE Kolkata section, and the immediate past vice chair technical activities of IEEE India Council. He is also a member of the IEEE Region 10 Conference and Technical Seminar and Committee. Now I would like uh, Professor Biswas to continue the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I'd like to express my thanks to both the NIT as well as CDAC for giving me this opportunity to share some of my uh, experiences rather than thoughts, experiences with you. Um, it's a, I mean, um, I am online, so it would have been much better with a lively interaction with everybody, but due to the constraints of the time we have to be online and to continue so i'd like to take permission to share my screen can i go ahead with sharing yes sir yes sir okay um let me see okay yeah i got it it's coming up okay now is my screen visible Yes, it is visible properly. Okay, it's like interacting with a ghostly environment because I don't see anybody now. I can only see my screen. So I hope if in case I get disconnected at any time, somebody has to call me back and say that otherwise I'll go on speaking. I don't know really. So thank you. And uh, the topic that I've selected is the challenges and the opportunities for integration of solar photovoltaic modules to a conventional grid. We are all aware that we need to look for new and new and renewable sources of energy. Sometimes also some of them are termed as green energy sources where they must come from naturally occurring resources without causing harm to the environment. And so out of them, solar is the prominent leader because in the process of extracting solar energy, we they do not go in for the conventional resources like mining, drilling. We do not burn anything, so we do not let out really gases into the atmosphere. And so it's sort of a clean and green type of energy source. And secondly, wind, of course, is there. But solar is fortunately available along the major part of India, as we'll see, whereas wind is restricted <coughs> mostly to the coastal areas. And both of them are intermittent, and both of them can 
complement each other really because solar is something which you get only for a definite part of the day typically in the middle part of india it's like you get the real significant amount of solar energy comes in from somewhere around 9:30 roughly in the morning to around 4:30 in the evening maybe shorter also sometimes you don't get the solar energy significant amount or nothing at all you don't get it at the other part of the time but wind can be available if it is available can be available throughout the day it's not restricted to day and night but both are fluctuating in nature intermittent in nature so one needs really to complement the other setting up solar installations is much more easier than wind you need large infrastructure you need open space for wind etc and solar literally you can mount it on your rooftop and people have been mounting on the top of their cars so it's as easy as that it's more convenient and that's the reason why we are talking about solar photovoltaic energy harvesting and we are talking about integrating it to a conventional grid so therefore let's take a look at how we have our existing conventional power system so we have electrical power generation transmission and utilization because generation in the conventional way needs additional material like water or coal supply or it may be a hydel which has to be located at a suitable location conveniently and where around that location there will not be many consumers of that electrical energy generated so most of the consumers will be far away located in uh, social clusters like maybe a city maybe a village it's located far away so in between you need your transmission system the transmission system has to transmit the power from the generating station up to the utilization point and so you have to have that transmission line connected up to that okay so therefore we have three component major components the generation the transmission and the utilization and where exactly are we talking of connecting the solar most of the time we are talking about connecting the solar down after the transmission system closer to the utilization system not really far away we can connect the solar far away but then the energy has to come all the way down and you will have unnecessary losses whereas there is no restriction for mounting solar panels anywhere unlike the conventional generating stations so most of the time we prefer it to be at the end of the transmission line close to the utilization point and therefore they are called as distributed generation as we'll see this is the typical electrical power flow path something what i illustrated there you have the generation plant then you have the transmission and then you can have the primary distribution system and then the secondary distribution system going down to your home or to the consumers who are industrial or business consumers now this part is called as the low tension supply system or the lt system typically three phase four wire system so that domestic consumers can avail of single phase supply systems our distribution supply is nominally rated at 400 volts so that line to neutral becomes 230 volts and the primary distribution system can be 11 kv or 33 kv depending on the application the higher transmission of course is still higher kilovolts so that you can make a trade off between the size of conductor and the cost of insulators that's what decides and so you can higher the voltage lesser is the current so you have different types of systems and this voltage ratings are important to uh, for us to know because if we have to connect something in the transmission line area even at the end of the transmission line the system our power electronic system has to be rated at that hundreds of kilovolts which is not easily possible directly even if we go in for the primary distribution system 33 kv or 11 kv our existing power electronic devices do not provide an economical solution i did not say they do not provide a solution mark my words i said they do not provide an economical solution for connection of direct connection here what we do most, most of the time is we operate our semiconductor devices at a lower bus voltage and then we connect it to the supply lines using a transformer so that the power semiconductors operate on a lower voltage side and the main line is on a higher voltage so we do connect it to 11 kv or 33 kv but most of the time we talk about connecting it to 400 volts line both can be done 
and both are being done at the present. So what is the conventional sources of electrical energy? It has been thermal power conventionally through burning of wood, burning of coal, burning of oil, burning of natural gases. I think there is still one uh, generating plant in the Northeast which still burns natural gas, others don't. And then we have nuclear power, of course, the conventional sources of electrical energy, and then we have hydropower. Hydropower has its own advantage and disadvantage. It has to be located at the suitable location and take power off from there, but it has the biggest advantage. It can be started almost as quick as possible whenever you are in need of, you are in need of electrical energy. The thermal power plants and the nuclear need a lot of preparatory time to start up, and once started, they are usually not stopped unless it's for a, some sort of a maintenance. Some of the green sources of electrical energy, the renewables, amongst the renewables, the green sources are wind, the solar, the geothermal, and the tidal. The others, as there may be some other aspects like biofuel, etc., but they are not green in the sense they, during the process of burning, you emit a lot of gases that affects the environment. So these are the typical sources of green energy. Now, this has been the existing grid as it has been till a few years back. We had a central generating plant somewhere down here. From here, we have the typical transmission line and then it comes to the distribution system and the power is distributed to different consumers as they are. So it's a passive transmission system and distribution system. And in case of any interruption of power from the main station or from the transmission line, things go dark. You don't have the power to any of the consumers and everything is coming from a centralized operation. What we are trying to do right now is to modify the grid so that we bring in certain local distributed generation at local points along with storages, perhaps storages everywhere it is not there. But that's our attempt right at the moment. We are trying to bring in distributed local generation and storage. So from here, we bring in something here. From here also, we can bring some power here. The advantage of providing local power generation on the distribution network is that the power has to flow over a shorter distance. So the line drops, the line losses are much reduced and they are able to stabilize the voltage because now suppose this consumer is was originally drawing power from the centralized point so the current whatever he's drawing has to come all the way along the transmission and the distribution network and that current has certain contribution in the total voltage drop taking place at this point of coupling if we feed in a power from a local point then the power this current disappears and the current is now flowing in a shorter distance so the voltage drop at this point is not that low uh, that much as it was earlier so you're improving the voltage stability at the local point by local power in, uh, injection and ultimately our target in the future is to have a distributed local generation storage right throughout so that we can send power in from one point to another and of course that requires many more things than simple Take a technology in terms of converters because our power line should be able to carry that power which we think we want to distribute. For example, if I want to send power from Calcutta to Bhubaneswar, the power line there must be able to absorb that power and I mean carry that power. So there are a lot more things that comes up into the infrastructure. So that is a different point. So we are now concentrating on the local generation aspect which is called as the distributed generation because distributed generation uses smaller size electricity generators than typical power plants being within 50 megawatts as per IEEE. This rating may be enhanced soon, but this is what we have right now. Distributed generation is using typically around 50 megawatts, but that does not mean that a single solar power plant cannot be more than 50 megawatt or the total power in injected into a distribution network cannot be more than 50 megawatt. No, we can have multiple numbers of 50 megawatt type of power injection points into the same grid, multiple points, suitable points, and we can support the local grid from all these resources that we have from the solar. And of course, it is connected at the distribution level, 
and they can be interconnected at nearly any point in the power system as distribution resources. DGs permit distributed generation permits collection of energy from many resources and may give lower environmental impact and improve security of supply. Improved security of supply means that suppose there is an interruption in the transmission line or in the generation, the local sources can support for a while, perhaps if there are energy sufficient amount of energy storage devices there, or at least if there is a peak demand which cannot be met from the central generating station, the local networks will be able to provide the peak power demand. The peak power need not have to be brought in over the transmission line. So it all depends. These things have to be thought out. These are concepts, the ideas, and we are already just starting experimenting. They have to be thought out. Really, there are a lot more many problems because switch gear, relaying, protection, tripping, fault, everything is going to be get involved. It's a complex power system. There are definite distinct benefits of distributed generation. First is enhanced reliability. You have the generation close to the load. So as I said, that if there is a problem in the transmission line or elsewhere, your local load need not get totally interrupted. It all depends on the capacity of your local network. You can have peak load shaving, that is reduction in peak demand by taking the power from the local network through DGs from solar. You have deferral of infrastructure expansion because you're going in for local generation. You don't have to expand the capacity of your transmission lines. Distribution system loss reduction because the generation is close to the load center, something which I mentioned a few minutes earlier, and lower grid integration costs. So local generation reduces size of connection to the main grid. Everything can be locally supplied. Distribution voltage connection uh, rather than transmission, that is the ease of installation and lower cost. That's another point that I had mentioned, the lower voltage makes it easier for us to make the connection of the con uh, converters directly to the voltage instead of going in for a higher voltage connection system. Although we may require a transformer, the trend today is to dispose of the transformer because then we are getting more better and better efficiencies. You, If you don't have the transformer, you save the losses that is happening, happening in the transformer along with the cost and the space required. And of course, it's going to give you a voltage support of weak distribution networks. That's what I mentioned earlier. Now, there are certain problems. Everything does not come with the only advantage. Everything does have certain disadvantages. So the major problem with the solar type of operations is that the generation power output variability. You have short time fluctuations, flickers, which happens in wind and solar because there is a cloud over the panel and suddenly the sunshine has lost its luster and there is a rid of drastic fall in the power generation or you can have long term fluctuations which involve voltage regulation voltage rise at connections long time fluctuations you have a rainy day one day two day no generation these are some of the problems associated with taking for solar so therefore it's obvious that solar cannot be the sole generating source even in the future, it will be a supportive source to other central generating stations. It cannot be the sole because first of all, you don't have it in the night. So, but you, we still consume power in the night. So it's going to be a supportive source. You can, ha you can have reactive power and voltage regulation coordination at the point using the same converters. You can have reactive compensation also along with interaction with switch capacitors. I will discuss this later, the interaction with switch capacitor networks. You have voltage regulation problems, impact on tap changing transfer operation and on volt span VAR compensation. So there will be interferences. We'll see these problems. The moment we have the distributed generation converters connected to the line, these type of problems comes up. Along with that, we have problem of harmonics and static power converter filter interaction. These converters inject a lot of harmonics into the supply lines and they in turn go and distort the supply voltage to the consumers. We will take a look at it later on. And of course, we can have an islanding and microgrid type of operation and operation in grid connected and islanded mode. It can be possible. So you have the system of transfer and of course, you can have a microgrid operation. 
Now everything is going to be done with power electronics because the whole concept of uh, the, this particular workshop is also power electronics. So I'd like to say power electronics can be considered as the technology that is associated with the conversion control and the conditioning of electrical power from its available form to the desired electrical form by the application of electronics. So firstly, we see that in power electronics, the input power is in electrical form and the output power is in electrical form. We are doing something in between to the electrical nature of the electrical energy that's flowing out. So if you see something that's where the output is not electrical, it's an application of power electronics. Maybe you see a motor speed control, then it's an application of power electronics to motor speed control. Or if you see the output as light, then you see light control, illumination systems. Then you see it's an application of power electronics to lighting control. It's, these are the applications. Now we can have conversion from of power, electrical power from one form to the other of our choice. For example, we have AC, we can convert it to DC. If we have DC, we can convert to AC. If we have DC of a particular voltage, we can change the voltage level. If we have AC, of a particular frequency, we can change the frequency the involved. So therefore, we can do any type of these conversions. And along with that, don't forget, if we have a voltage source, we can convert it to a current source. So literally everything that is possible can be done through power electronics. We have an excellent control over the entire process. And also we can do conditioning. Conditioning literally means you don't convert. But for example, you have a sine wave, you have, have a supply, which is an AC not a very good sine wave. So all you do is smoothen out the sine wave without changing the frequency. So that's conditioning. So you can either convert, control or conditioning the system. And that's a lot more activities involved than within the rest than what we can say within these three words. This is a typical power electronic converter, not the small converter that we have in the lab, what we put out on the network in terms of distributed generation. And this converter has many things into it built in. You can see large switch gear, magnetic components. Then you have the semiconductor stack. The semiconductor stack has cooling fans on the top, control system, circuits, etc. So everything goes into a building, a tall rack like this. And you can have several such units stacked side by side. Uh, these are filters for uh, I mean, the air to flow out, nothing can should be able to enter. So you see the total power electronic converter is a combination, not only of electrical engineering, but control systems, the digital systems, mechanical systems in term of, terms of heat management, magnetics, et cetera, switchgear, classical power systems, and so on. It's a huge complex system that's to be developed and interconnected to the line. Because our line, the supply lines are not the ideal as we teach to our students. The supply frequency is neither fixed at 50.000. It keeps varying at least by one hertz. The supply waveform is not sinusoidal. The supply waveform can change. The supply phases are not balanced. The supply phases are in fact practically unbalanced. You don't have a balanced output. So whenever we teach to the students, we say, a three phase uh, rectifier produces an output ripple, which is six times of the input supply frequency. That's true only when the supply voltages are balanced. The moment you have one voltage, which is larger than the others, you will see that peak coming in at the output at a higher magnitude. And so 100 Hertz ripple comes in at the output of a 300 Hertz rectifier. 100 Hertz ripple comes in at the output of a 300 Hertz. So I mean three phase rectifier. So you have these problems in real life, which we have to tackle. The supply phase can fail, and the, you have to take a decision whether the system can operate or not. If it is going to operate, then it's a fault tolerant system. Can my system operate if one limb goes off? That's good if I can manage it, because then everything is not going to be shut off. You see, the biggest problem in solar is you are cannot stop generation. As long as sunlight is there, generation will continue. It's up to you whether you will to utilize or not utilize. The lines will be active. So how is power electronics able to 
uh, be applied to distributed generation. Firstly, to permit integration of varying voltage, varying frequency or DC sources to the fixed frequency, fixed voltage AC grid. DC sources typically solar. Solar output is DC. To compensate for harmonic currents generated by nonlinear loads. These nonlinear loads are connected to the line already or my converter itself can create certain problems. Both. The power electronics is used as static systems for compensation of leading as well as lagging VAR. It's used for high speed compensation, smooth stepless operation, no moving parts, no periodic maintenance and high efficiency of the converter. Today, power electronic converters and inverters can use for solar have the efficiencies much higher than 95%. Some claim to have it around close to 98%, but though they are at specific loads, you have to understand efficiency is a function of load because efficiency has losses and losses have basically two types of losses are there. One type of loss, which is a resistive loss, which is proportional to the square of the current, I square into R, and the other loss is proportional to the voltage drop. OK, so therefore we have two types of losses in power electronic system. And unless these losses are kept low, you are not going to have efficient good efficiency. But on the other hand, even if I say efficiency is good, the thermal management is a problem. Let me give you an example of one megawatt converter. Let's say hypothetically has a 90% efficiency. I've just taken arbitrary no, figures. So metal mass is much quicker. So okay, with 90% efficiency, uh, I have, uh, somebody can be muted. Somebody's voice is heard. Can you mute? Can you mute, please? Somebody's, hello, somebody's voice is being heard. Can be mute? OK. OK, thank you. So uh, let's say a 100 megawatt converter with a 90% efficiency means you have 100 kilowatts of loss. As simple as that. Now, 100 kilowatts of loss is a huge amount of energy that's going to generate a lot of heat. So what I mean to say here is that efficiency is not the criterion. Thermal management is very, very important. Our semiconductor devices do not operate with more than about 125 to 150 degrees centigrade at the junction point inside the semiconductor. So if you're talking about the case of the semiconductor, not more than 100 degrees centigrade at all. So you have to control the temperature of the devices to maintain the operation of the devices so that they don't fail. And at the same time, you have to control the losses in the system so that you get the highest efficiency. How is power electronics able to tackle the situation through the availability of high power, high loss, high switching frequency semiconductor devices? Amongst most of the semiconductor devices that we have today, most of the time we are applying the IGBT or the insulated gate bipolar transistor because that technology has matured to a level where we can really use it to any application. The type of the semiconductor, of course, can be changed from conventional silicon to uh, silicon carbide, etc. But this, the device is still the IGBT. It has its own advantages of operation and in real life, what the conventional IGBT is silicon based we switch internationally, not only in this country, at around 10 to around roughly about 10 kilohertz in air natural cooled operation, and we can switch it about 15 kilohertz or higher at four school application, irrespective of whatever is said in the textbook. Because if you run it at higher frequencies, your losses will be higher. That's the catch. So if you want your system to be really efficient, you can't switch it at more very high frequencies. Unless, of course, you go in for soft switching. That's a different issue. Through, though, through the development of technology permitting high performance, high power converters to be built and operated reliably on the power line. This is another development in power electronics. We have built high performance, high power converters that can be operated reliably on the power lines withstanding the type of failures of the power lines, the surges that will come from the power lines can be withstood, like including lightning surges. If there is a fault on the power line, my converter should withstand. Things are very touchy here. Suppose that I have a solar system which is feeding power to the grid and there is a short circuit fault on the grid. 
that my solar system will also try to feed power into that fault, so, uh, feed current into that fault. So therefore, my system should be protected against all these types of overcurrent and short circuit situations. And there may be a sudden phase failure. Things should move on as it is. And it, uh, through the availability of high speed real time digital computing system. This is one of the real boons. We rarely speak of it, but without the real time digital computing systems, all these developments in power electronics could not have been put into practice because we are all dependent silently on this particular aspect, this digital platform that permits high speed real time computing systems in different ways. So the backbone of all that we are talking about in power electronics integration to the grid is this really silent uh, behind the scene operator. The advantage of power electronic converters is that it permits us to make different sources to work together without compromising power quality. It maintaining the stable power flow, maintaining high efficiency and keeping costs low. The development in high power converters involve high efficiency inverters with sinusoidal output voltages and currents. High performance bidirectional power converters with capability of connection to the AC grid. We often need bidirectional power converters for various applications as we'll see. High efficiency bidirectional DC to DC power converters for controlled energy storage and retrieval. If you want to store power in a battery, you need a DC to DC converter to control the charging current of the battery and when you're retrieving it from the from the battery, you still need another DC to DC converter to convert it to the required voltage. Most of the time the DC bus voltages are higher than the battery voltages. So charging the battery, you have to maintain a charge on the battery from the higher voltage DC bus and when you're retrieving power, you have to boost the voltage up to the required voltage to match that of the DC bus. So you need bidirectional DC to DC power converters. Fax devices or flexible AC transmission system devices are required with low total harmonic distortion of current and smooth operation of AC power systems because we are connecting so many items into the line and most of these power electronic converters are injecting harmonics and VAR into the system. We need to take care of these aspects by adding fax devices to the line. Now, as we are talking about storage systems, etc., before we move on, we make a distinction between energy and power buffers. You see the solar curves, the energy content here is zero because there is no sunlight up to this interval. And after this sunlight builds up, so we the available power builds up and there are interruptions, short time interruption because of passage of cloud over the solar uh, panel. And then again, it becomes zero in the evening. If we want to support these temporary dips of shortages of power available from the solar panel, then the best solution is to use ultra capacitors or flywheels, which are called as power buffers to provide backup for the short time. But if you want a backup for this time when the, I mean the solar radiation is not there, when the energy recovered from sunlight is zero, then you have to go back and depend upon energy buffers like batteries. So you have two distinctions, energy buffers and power buffers. In terms of storage of electrical energy, of course, battery storage system is one of the oldest system where we have to know that we have to control the amount of current that is going into the battery so that the chemical change that's taking place, the electrochemical change takes place at the desired rate. Temperature does not increase within the battery because the increase of temperature is a detrimental process to the chemical change. So we should not overheat the battery. So charging current has to be controlled. We can have hydrogen storage system for fuel cells and the government of India at the present is putting in a lot of stress on developing technologies for hydrogen storage systems. We can have supercapacitor storage systems uh, for short time, short bursts of energy. And of course, of we can have superconducting magnetic energy storage systems. Now talking about the solar photovoltaics, why energy from the sun, I think I've already stated and you would have seen such similar graphs repeated almost in every lecture. So I just like to go through very briefly, it just says that our 
conventional resources of oil, gas, and coal are being depleted at a rapid rate. So we have to be concerned what is to be done for the future. This is the energy curve. Now, this is a solar energy map for India, which is very bright. So you see in the mainland of India, we have a huge amount of sunshine, or we can say we are blessed with a lot of sunshine, except for the northeastern part, which does not have that amount of sunshine. And don't forget Port Blair, uh, the Andaman Islands here, they do have some amount of sunshine. So therefore, there is a lot of scope for developing solar energy, generating stations are all around these areas, particularly Andaman Islands, because they don't have any captive power plant. They de utilize diesel generators for supplying the power in the Andaman, which is very expensive. And the, all the diesel has to be carried from the mainland by ships. So there are a lot of opportunities for developing solar uh, support for these the, the main grid. As I said earlier, solar cannot be the 100 percent source of energy. It will be a supportive source of energy so that your consumption of the conventional fossil fuels will reduce. And solar energy can be used in basically two forms, solar photovoltaic or solar thermal. We are concentrating on solar photovoltaic because it's easy to implement and the output is electrical so that the electrical energy can be consumed by us in the normal way that we use the supply from the I mean the commercial electricity supply providers. Solar thermal will be only local application area where you have a heating application either for a kitchen or some sort of process plant. Of course, with solar thermal, you can generate electricity, but that's not, not a very efficient process because with solar thermal, you have to generate steam. From the steam, you have to run a steam turbine. From the turbine, you have to run a generator. And every conversion process has its own efficiency. The overall efficiency just multiplies up. And you see if two 90% efficiency systems are cascaded, the resulting efficiency is roughly 80% only. So therefore, that gives a very good idea that you don't go in for cascaded system, go for a direct system. At the same time, the market considerations for solar photovoltaic are promising. Solar electric energy growth has been consistently at 20% to 25% per annum over the past 20 years. And it shows an increasing efficiency of solar cells. The manufacturing technology is improving. Economies of scale, large scale systems are getting more and more, becoming more and more economical. Now, in India, we have something called as the National Solar Mission, NSM, which has set out a target of 20 gigawatt of grid connected solar power by 2022, which was revised in June 15 to 100 gigawatt by 2022. Of course, the 100 gigawatt is not totally solar photovoltaic. It has been, I mean, broken up into different types of projects, let's say 40 gigawatts expected sol rooftop solar, large and medium scale grid connected solar projects, 60 gigawatts and so on. There will be <coughs> scope also for thermal, solar thermal applications and so on. What have we achieved? And along with this thing, we cannot, I mean, keep aside along with the National Solar Mission, the NAMPED under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, that is the National mission for the power electronics technology. So they go hand in hand. You cannot have a solar mission without involving the power electronic activities. So what we have achieved are some examples of major solar power plants in India that I found out that many people are not even aware we have such things executed already. It's existing in India. The largest that I could find is the Bharla Solar Park in Rajasthan which is 2,245 megawatt. We have the Pavagada Solar Park in Karnataka around 2,000 megawatt. NP Kunta, Andhra Pradesh, 1,500 megawatt. I've just selected some of the highest ratings to give you an idea, the range the, of power of capacity that we have already built in to this country. And the list goes on and on and on. So we do have it already in the country and Interestingly, we also have a floating solar power plant in coastal Andhra at a place called as Simhadri. 
It covers uh, 20, 100 acres and we have 25 megawatt generating capacity from this. The entire solar panels are kept on the water which is floating. It's basically floating. We need a lot of surface area to capture the solar energy. That is the only major disadvantage of solar. So you can put it on the rooftop. It's not being used. You can put it somewhere else, but you cannot put it on land which is being cultivated at least once in a year because the shade produced by the solar panels is not good for the cultivation below it. So you have to find a suitable area where the putting the solar panels, the, the shadow that's created is not going to be detrimental to for any other process that might have been going on there. So it's a good idea to put it on the water and you don't cover the entire water so that the rest of the uh, I mean, life below the water can continue as it was. Fishes, algae, they continue to grow and continue there. You're not disturbing the environment. Now, coming back to photovoltaic cell characteristic curves, I think most of the people knows that it's a nonlinear characteristic for voltage versus current. And the curve changes with irradiation of sunlight and with temperature. And that there is a point on the voltage current or the voltage power curve which is called as the maximum power point at which the entire PV system operates with the maximum efficiency under the given solar isolation at that time. Uh, the location of the MPPT is not known, but it can be located. It's like this, a typical photovoltaic characteristic curve, current versus voltage. So it just shows that at a zero voltage, you have a large current. Zero voltage means you have short circuited the solar cell and you have a large current, significant current here, and that's the short circuit current from the solar cell, which means the solar cell, it confirms back that it's the current source. The current does not increase significantly, it's limited. At the same time, when you have an open circuit of the solar panel, this is the open circuit voltage and the current is zero. So if you multiply the instantaneous voltage and current at any time, then you'll find that the power voltage into current, which is the power, comes up from zero because anything multiplied by zero is zero. And then here also you have a voltage voltage with zero current is zero. And in between you see multiplication of current into voltage goes on increasing, 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 and then decreases. So this is the plot of power. And we see that somewhere along the curve, perhaps at this point, we have the maximum power that is available at this instant. I use the word at this instant means because this current characteristic is for this instant with whatever is the temperature of the panel available right now and with the available solar sunlight that's coming available right now. So it will change with time, time to time. It keeps changing. So the curve keeps changing. So we have to keep tracking this. Now, one way how to achieve that our system operation should be at this point. I can try to make a point A, which means you have a certain area under the current and voltage characteristic, which is quite small area. You can choose point B, the area is bigger, or you can choose point C, where the area again becomes smaller. So obviously, the peak power point is at the operation of the, at the point D on the current versus voltage characteristics, and that gives you the optimum area at this instant. How do you find it out? You have to make changes in the load to find out this point. And in order to keep operating at that point, you have a fixed amount of power available. That means your power to the load has to be monitored and modified. You cannot say, I always want 100 watts of power to the output. Not possible from this solar panel. It may be possible at some time, it may not be possible at other times. For example, if the peak power that is available is more than the load demand, then of course you can operate at any one of these two points, the, both the sides. Obviously, we'd like to operate on this side because that's the highest voltage. But if the peak power available at the any instant is lower than the demand, you cannot supply that much of power. It's not possible to supply that magnitude of power. So you have to keep adjusting the power into the load. So this is a real problem in the solar system. And you see these are the different types of curves available for different temperatures of the panel. You can see the curve changes that open circuit voltage changes a little bit. 
and short circuit current does change a little bit and for different irradiation levels obviously the amount of current changes drastically but the voltage does not change significantly the open circuit voltage remains almost constant and if correspondingly if you look in, into the power versus voltage characteristic this is the change that you see the peak power point will change slightly but it's almost roughly shall i say crude way roughly 80% of the open circuit voltage. That's not an exact figure, but that's a rough idea where it is. And here you can see for different irradiation levels, how the peak power point changes. It's almost at the same point, almost, but it, the magnitude wise, it keeps changing. And when we are talking of temperature, we are talking about the temperature of the solar cell. We are not talking about the ambient temperature because let's say the ambient is cool on a sort of a winter day ambient is quite chilly but the solar panel is exposed to sunlight and because of sunlight the direct sunlight falling on the panel the temperature of the panel goes on increasing so the temperatures we are talking here are the solar cell temperatures and not the ambient temperature this is to be clearly understood so any temperature compensation you want to do you have to sense the temperature of the panel which is a difficult task you'll get an approximate idea now, in order to do the maximum power point tracking system, you have to build an electronic system that allows the modules to produce all the power they are capable of. It does not refer to the mechanical tracking system. That's different. If you want to keep tracking the sun, that's a different system. So it varies the electrical operating point to deliver maximum available power. There are different types of MPPT algorithms involves perturb and observe incremental conductance, et cetera, et cetera. There are different methods you can adopt anyone or you can find out a method of your own. And the problem becomes complex when you have multiple panels in operation. So under partially shaded condition means one of the panel has been shaded because of cloud coming over that local point. All the panels are not shaded. So there is a, there are, I mean, local maximas instead of a global one. So your system, your algorithm must be able to track so that you're able to operate on the global maximum power and not op get stuck to a local maximum. Because if it's stuck to a local maximum, the available power is smaller, whereas you could have achieved this much of power extraction from the system. So these are some of the challenges with the monitoring system to get the maximum power output. The problems of solar photovoltaic generation system is that conversion efficiency in the solar photovoltaic power is low. Still today, it's about 18, 20%, uh, sorry, yeah, 12 to 18 typically, but about 20% in commercial, uh, commercially available solar panels as of now. Although modern technology has demonstrated peak efficiency is over 30%, but what is commercially available is just around 20% efficiency of conversion from sunlight to electricity. The amount of electric power generated by solar arrays changes continuously with the time of the day as well as with the month of the year. So that's the problem of fluctuation, short time and long time fluctuations. So you cannot depend on the panel for constant supply, but it's going to augment. So what it does is indirectly tries to reduce down the amount of fossil fuel burning so that you save on carbon footprint. Generation is affected by weather conditions, dust accumulation, temperature, etc. Weather conditions we have discussed, but dust is something which is often neglected. I mount a solar panel on my rooftop and think that every day I'm going to get the required amount of energy. I'm wrong because dust accumulation on top of the solar panel creates a layer that reflects off a part of the light from sun that's falling on the panel. So I am not able to absorb all the light that's available falling on the panel. Part of it gets reflected. So you have to keep cleaning the panels on a regular basis. That is very vital. And the load demand pattern changes with the time of the day as well as with the month of the year. That is the type of amount of load that's required keeps changing. We will discuss on this later on once again. The challenges in the photovoltaic system are to achieve high efficiency sinusoidal inverter designs, grid synchronization and power delivery, grid connection without transformer so that we save on the uh, losses in the transformer, 
it's a challenge because you can have without a transformer, you have a lot of uh, common mode currents, zero sequence components flowing in and the risk of shock hazard if you touch the solar panels. So leakage currents from the solar panels are going to increase if you don't have a transformer because the solar panels become live at the main supply voltage. So the insulation of the quality of insulation of the panel is going to be put to a test. And of course, fault tolerance. That is, if a part of the panel structure fails, what do you do? It should keep operating. If a, uh, a limb of the inverter fails, can you keep sending power? Maybe reduced amount, but can you keep sending power? These are all the important aspects and challenges in the photovoltaic systems. Everybody wants reliability, long operational lifetime, but most photovoltaic module manufacturers offers you a warranty of 25 years on 80% of the initial efficiency. That is written in small letters. Not 100% of the initial efficiency because the solar panel and other things will deteriorate, not the semiconductor devices. Solar panels efficiency will deteriorate. That's the major contribution uh, on the efficiency part. Okay. The main limiting components inside that's the second supplementing part inside the inverters are the electrolytic capacitors, which are used for power decoupling between the PV module and the grid. So these power capacitors restrict the amount of lifetime that you can expect because after some times of years of operation, depending on the temperature that uh, to which they are subjected, the capacitors degrade and ultimately there is a short circuit in the dielectric inside and they fail. So therefore, if they fail, the entire inverter system keeps uh, fails. Why do we need the electrolytic capacitors? Because they have to absorb the reactive power and the power line ripples because the reactive power cannot flow back to the DC side. There is no absorption of power on the DC side. So we'll see why the electrolytic capacitor is required and what is the flow of reactive power inside the inverters. We'll take a look at that later. Now solar inverter or photovoltaic inverter converts the direct current output of a photovoltaic solar panel into a utility frequency alternating current that can be fed into a commercial electrical grid or used by a local offline electrical network. Both are possible. You can have a local load or you can feed it into the grid or you can have both. So based on that, solar inverters may be classified into three broad types. Standalone inverters where there is no real power connection with the grid. You have a solar system and you have a local load, maybe my house. I have a solar panel and I'm using it for a house. My house is located in a remote area far away where there is no electrical supply. That's an example of a standalone inverter. You have grid tie inverters where I'm generating power from the solar panels and feeding it directly to the grid. I don't have any local load connection. Whatever I generate goes into the grid. And third is the battery backup inverter where I do have a local load as well as I'm sending power back into the grid. So because of that, I have a battery backup for my local load. In case the solar generation is not there and the grid is not there, power can be used from my battery backup. So broadly three types of operation. So standalone solar inverter system is in used in isolated system. The inverter draws its DC energy from batteries which are charged from the photovoltaic arrays. And they also in can you have integral chargers to operate from an AC source if the source is available. They do not interface in any way with the utility. It does not have any requirement to have any anti-islanding protection because it's not connected to the grid. Grid tie, it matches phase with a utility supplied sine wave, exactly what I have said. They do not provide power backup. And the grid tie inverter converts DC power produced by the panel to AC power. And here the battery backup, you have an addition of the battery system to it. So if you take a look at the sizing, how do you go ahead for a solar photovoltaic generation system sizing? A rough idea, approximate. It's not a mathematical precise calculation that I'm showing. Rough idea for you. Suppose I want a 100 kVA inverter out which output shall be ideally 100 kilowatt at unity power factor. In the market, commercial market, there are a lot of tricks put on that if you have a 100 kVA inverters, 
some manufacturers say you cannot get 100 kilowatts. I ask why, because it's rated, if it's rated on the current rating, then 100 kilowatts inverter should be able to provide me with a unity power factor 100 kilowatts of power. It's like you, when you buy a UPS, you see there are lots of tricks. They'll tell you that, no, 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 you can't load it up to, uh, suppose you are buying a 100 watt system, they'll say, no, you can't load it up to 100 watts. You can load it up to 80 watts. Those are commercial aspects. They are not technical aspects. Technically, a 100 kVA inverter should be able to provide you with 100 kilowatts of power at unity power factor. The current is the limiting factor. So if your power factor becomes less than unity, then of course the wattage will availability will reduce because you will hit the current limit. And then the solar photovoltaic panel must have a capacity of typically 120 kilowatts peak. Considering the practical dust accumulation on the panels, the losses in power transmission from the panels to the grid, everything combined, you have a roughly 120 kilowatt peak capacity requirement for a 100 kVA inverter system. Now, the total cost of such a grid connected system without a battery and MPPT charger, because you don't have a battery, you don't have an MPPT charger, including supply, installation, commissioning, and five years of warranty are typical prices, a uh, couple of years old, might have increased right now with the changes of pricing, but still it gives you a rough idea. 100 kVA inverter system will cost around 63 lakhs, a 50 kVA is around 33 lakhs and a 25 kVA is around 18 lakhs, approximate ideas of the total system. That includes supply installation means civil work, everything is involved into it. Now, when we have such systems, you have to remember that many things are special. You know, when you have the solar panel installed, the top cover of the solar panel must be able to withstand the ultraviolet rays that is reaching it from the sunlight and not get degenerated. For example, if you put a plastic bucket on your rooftop and go back and take a look at it after a month, it just crumbles. Why? Because the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun, sun I, mean, I mean, they break the bonding between the polymer that is constituting the plastic bucket. The polymer bonds are broken and they simply degenerate. So that is, implies that the cables that you are going to use and the top cover that you are going to use for the solar panel must be able to withstand ultraviolet radiation. So ordinary systems cannot be used. You need special covering and you need, need special type of cables on it with the which can lie for a long duration. You are talking of 25 years of reliability, then your cable should better last for 25 years without getting degenerated. So the costs are involved <coughs> into it to get the special, <coughs> special systems. Okay. Now we come up to a typical example of a roof mounted grid connected system. Now here the idea is that you have a roof connected grid uh, system where you have the solar photovoltaic modules put on the roof. And we expect that we have a connection that takes down the power to the inverter systems. So we use a part of that power here for the house internal consumption, and we might be able to feed back a part of the power into the grid. So this is going to draw a lot of, I mean, this points of discussion. First of all, yes, I can put panels on my roof. I can generate electricity. I can consume it. But whether I can feed it back to the grid or not depends on whether the utility has provided me with a two-way metering system here. If I do not have a two-way metering system, be cautious that even if you send back power, your meter will read positive as if you have consumed power and you will be billed for it at the end of the month. Because the meter has no way of detecting whether the power is going from your house outward or from outward into your house. As for the standard aspects of meters in this country, meters are designed such that their reading cannot be reduced. Whether it is an electromechanical meter or an electronic meter, their readings cannot be reduced so that they are made to, uh, to be protected against pilferage. Somebody cannot reduce the reading. That is why even if you send power backwards, they give you the value of absolute reading. That is, they will give you a positive reading. So if you do not have a two-way metering, 
you cannot really send back power to the grid. You just forget it until wait until the electricity provider really permits you with a two-way metering system, which is a controversial area because that's not a technical area. That's a commercial area, which we'll see. I know that uh, different electricity providers are providing two-way metering only for institutions. Yes, but not to domestic consumers yet. Okay, but that's a just that was just a word of caution for me. For uh, from my side. Second thing is, even if you are not able to send back power, you can still still save on the your electricity bills. How? Let's say at any time in the day, my house is consuming 10 kilowatts of power from the electricity without the solar panel. At a particular time, the consumption is 10 kilowatts of power. It might be in my whatever way I consume that power. Now, if I install a five kilowatt capacity solar panel here, then five kilowatts of power is being sent in. Then you realize that total 10 kilowatt consumption out of that five kilowatt, if it is coming from the solar panel, then the remaining five kilowatt has to come from the commercial supply. Therefore, the commercial supply billing now is being done only at five kilowatts, not 10 kilowatts because of the solar panel. So indirectly, I do have a saving on my electricity bill. Now, still there are more catches. Yes, if I have a big, uh, let's say, uh, I mean, academic institution or whatever is a industry or a factory where I install solar panel like this to save on my electricity bills, and yet I do not have a two way metering. In such cases, there is one more word of caution. On holidays, you have to be careful because on a holiday, the panel will generate electricity. It will convert electricity, but there will be hardly any consumption here because on the holiday, everything is shut off. So it will try to send power back into the grid and you will have a positive reading when you come back the next uh, working day. So your billing has increased. So on holidays, you have to ensure the disconnection of this power from either from this side or from this side so that power does not flow backwards because even though you had assumed you had taken 50% of the consumption, on the holiday, the total consumption is negligible. So even that 50% power can try to flow backwards, giving you a positive reading on the meter. So you have to be careful on your usage of solar panel. Now comes the most tricky part. We talk a lot about putting solar panels on homes, on houses. Is it really feasible? I'm not talking about the economical aspects. Is it operationally feasible? Let's take a look. I put a solar panel on my house and forget about feeding it power, power back. I say that I'm going to consume the entire power. I'm not, I don't have a two way metering. I'm not thinking of feeding power back. Fine, I accept it. So what happens is I put the panel here. So every day the panel starts generating electricity from roughly 9.30 in the morning to about 4.30 in the afternoon, fine. The question is who is in the house at that time to consume this power? for an average Indian household, urban household, I repeat average Indian urban household, the only person in the house is to be an elderly person, a senior person, perhaps watching TV, nothing else. Then who is going to consume that power? Nobody, because the main people who would have consumed power, like the husband and wife, they are out at work. The children are either at college or school, and there's nobody to consume that amount of electricity which is being generated during the daytime, during this time of 9.30 to 4.30. So the electricity is not consumed really. You don't have, you are not able to consume. So what do you do? You need now to solve the problem to put a battery back up and store all the solar energy into your battery. There's no way out because you can't feed it back to the mains. So you store the energy in a battery you have a big battery backup system and in the evening when everybody comes back, that's the time you have to use that energy. You should not use the energy from the domestic, I mean commercial supply. If you, you use the energy after coming back in the evening from the commercial supply, then you are not using the sun, solar energy and you are not going to get any saving. So at that time you have to disconnect even though power is there and keep using energy from the battery to do all your work here. Maybe run the um, washing machine, run the uh, air conditioning system, whatever you want to do from the battery backup system. That is the only way to utilize the energy from the sunlight. 
And in that process, obviously, the battery is going to get drained out. If you drain out the battery totally, and if the power, there is an interruption in the middle of the night, you don't have any backup. So you do, can't, you cannot discharge the battery fully. At the maybe you decide on a percentage, 50% discharge or 60% discharge. You decide on a factor and you discharge it to that extent. Save a little amount of energy here for contingency conditions like power interruption in the middle of the night, so that you can get a emergency like a UPS type of operation and can maintain the lights and fans in your rooms. Next day, the battery has to be charged once again from the solar panels. If you charge the battery from the mains, and if the battery is full, then there is no opportunity to take in more energy from the solar panel, even though the panel is able to deliver energy. So these are some of the very critical things which you need to look into, which no vendor of solar panel, uh, solar system is willing to discuss because they just want to sell it to you. And you as a consumer, a domestic consumer, have to be very careful about these aspects. If I install a solar panel on my rooftop, will I really be benefited by under the given conditions that I'm projecting? Or you can work out for yourself to see how much of this is really applicable in your case. For a, uh, say, housing system or a factory or a commercial building, it's feasible because there is somebody there during the daytime to use. So the solar electricity generated will be used directly. But for a domestic urban area, domestic house, it's unlikely that anybody is there to use it. And if you have to store the energy in a battery for long term use, think of the cost that you have to invest in the large battery installation that you're going to maintain here. These are some of the practical aspects that I want to point out in terms of individual solar systems. Now, solar grid connected systems can be of multiple types. Decentralized systems where all the houses down the road have their own panel to AC conversion systems and they are being connected to the grid. Or in a society, every house decides to convert it to DC, common DC bus, feed the power into the DC and there is a central uh, inverter in the housing society which converts DC to AC. Or it might happen that the panels are all individually connected together, the solar panels, and then you have a single inverter to convert to AC. It depends. So you have a decentralized system, you have a quasi-centralized and a centralized system. All our large installations are mostly centralized system, but it has its own advantages and disadvantages as we'll see here. A centralized system means everything is there at one place. In a short sentence, that's the meaning. So here what it means is that you have a string of photovoltaic modules connected in series so that you get the desired voltage that you want. Series connection like batteries gives you the desired voltage. And in order to get the power that you want, the more amount of current, you have to put them in parallel. So you have series connection of strings. This is a string and you have parallel connections. You have to connect them through so-called string diodes in series so that in case of one, the failure of one panel or so in one string redu reduces the total string voltage. The other string cannot backfeed power within this. That is, this comprises of several panels, and if there is a failure of one panel, the total end-to-end -end voltage comes down, and then the other panels cannot backfeed power into this. So you have to have sort of blocking diodes, which are called as string diodes. So because of the diode connections, you have losses in the diodes systems. And then you have a combined total inverter, which converts DC to AC, and you have the phase connections. To overcome these problems, the technology has shifted to string inverters, where every string of series connected panels have their own inverter. You don't go in for the paralleling of the panels. Rather, you go in for the paralleling of the inverter systems here so that you get rid of the diode. So there is no losses on the string diode because there's no string diode is there. So only one single string of panel is connected to individual inverter and you just synchronize and parallel. So it increases the overall efficiency. Plus, it increases reliability. Suppose one string has failed, the other strings can continue to supply power. You can have multi-string inverters 
where in the earlier case, we had an inverter per string. Here you do have a single inverter, but every string has its own MPPT operated DC to DC converter. So you have, you have a degree of flexibility involved. So every string can have its own DC to DC converter for its own MPPT operation. That gives you better operation even in partial shading. Suppose this string is partially shaded, its own MPPT will give its own global um, MPPT and this one may not be shaded. It will be operated on, a, on its own MPPT and the combination gives you the total power through a single inverter system. There are also applications where individual AC modules are connected below panels. So these are micro inverters or small inverters connected to one, sets of panels and the inverter sets are together. They are matched. So inverter and module are matched together as one electrical device. So there is no mismatch between photovoltaic modules and there is optimal adjustment of MPPT along with the point. And you have to, of course, have a high voltage amplification because you are not taking a large string of panels. So ultimately, the AC to DC to AC has to go in through a voltage amplification process. The inverters by themselves may be single stage inverters or they may be dual stage inverter. That is one stage of DC to DC may be involved into it or you may not have one more stage. It may be a single. This stage is often required where you have batteries. If you want to have a place where you have to charge the battery from the DC bus, then you need a MPPT converter here itself. We'll discuss that further. Let us take up a typical system of photovoltaic self fed solar power generation system. And we say that as sunlight falls on the panel, you have the connection through the MPPT converter through inverter to load. But this is not going to meet our requirement because there will be fluctuation in the solar insulation and therefore the maximum power available from the panel itself is going to vary and so the power available through the load is going to vary which means the voltage across the load is likely to vary so you are going to get a fluctuating voltage there will be a flicker on the bulb there so it's not really worthwhile so what we do is we need to have a battery as a backup and the battery can be charged from the same MPPT converter and can feed back power into the inverter. So now we have a better system so that even if there is no sunlight, the battery can keep operating. And if you have a grid here, it's still better. You can close a switch and then this becomes a bidirectional converter. It was not. It was an inverter earlier. Now it becomes bidirectional because you can charge the battery from the grid also in case you don't get enough energy from the solar panel. So therefore, this system is much better. It keeps operating on its own and the MPPT keeps tracking the sunlight and the panel output power. In case there is no sunlight available, then the battery keeps supplying power or it can be charged from the grid and keeps supplying the local load, as I said. And if the grid fails, you can still maintain supply on the local load. OK. Now, you can go in for a system, like I mentioned, without storage. So you don't have a local load, which means you don't need the battery. So all these are cut out. You don't need them. So in this case, what happens is you can get rid of the word bidirectional con converter and say inverter, and you can further get rid of the MPPT converter and connect it directly because the function of the maximum power point tracking can be done by the inverter itself. There is nowhere else that the power is flowing. The power is flowing through the inverter, so the inverter can control the amount of power that's flowing out. So that means you are having indirect MPPT operation because MPPT is maximum power point tracking. So the inverter does everything there. Fine. Now, having said about all these basic processes, let's see what is the effect of these power electronic converters on the power system. First of all, we come up to power quality. What is power quality? Is the interaction of electrical power supply system with electrical equipment. And if there is any power problem manifested in the voltage, current, or frequency deviation, then it is a power quality problem. So I'm just cutting this short. You will get to know much more about power quality aspects. So power quality problem includes all possible situations in which the waveform of the supply voltage 
or load current deviates from the sinusoidal waveform at rated frequency with amplitude corresponding to the rated RMS value for all three phases of a three phase system. You're talking about a balanced system literally here. And power quality disturbances cover sudden, short duration deviation, impulsive oscillatory transients, voltage dips or sags, short interruptions, as well as steady state deviations such as harmonics and flickers. Everything is a power quality problem. Power quality issues involve power factor improvement, reduction of harmonics, removing transients and noise, improvement of voltage regulation, preventing voltage interruptions and single phasing, preventing neutral burnout in LT supply. This is one of the biggest problems because we consider that in even LT system should be balanced. So there was a provision earlier to supply power to so-called three and a half core cable. The half core means the neutral cross section used to be 50% of that of the line, assuming that the load is going to be balanced and there would not be significant current in the neutral. Unfortunately, today the situation is entirely different. Take a case of power electronic load like a switch mode power supply used for a desktop. Even though we balance the current, uh, the desktop loads on the different RYB phases, each desktop current is non sinusoidal and there is a third harmonic component in that current. All the third harmonic components in the input current are actually zero sequence components and they will flow through the neutral only. They cannot find a return path through the lines. So therefore, the neutral current becomes unpredictably large if you put a nonlinear load, even though the loads are balanced on the phases because of zero sequence of third harmonic components. There is a provision of load balancing and improvement of reliability are all the power quality issues. The reasons for increased concern over power quality is that the newer generation equipment with microprocessor, microcontroller, DSP, etc., is more sensitive to power quality variations than those used in the past. We had mechanical relaying system for our protection devices. Today we have solid state devices. You can understand that the impact is much more in terms of sensitivity. In order to improve efficiency and performance, the increased use of power electronic interface with the supply system is creating increased disturbance on the latter and has many people concerned about the future impact. Today we have, uh, I mean, solid state drives connected in factories in different installations. We have power supply systems in our laptop, our mobile phone, our desktop systems, our overhead projectors. Everywhere we have these power supplies. They are all injecting harmonics into the line. So they are all power electronic interfaces that are creating problems. And addition of solar based converters will also create problems because they are also power electronic converters. The increasing emphasis on overall power system efficient and reliable operation has resulted in the need to tackle various unforeseen problems instead of simple applications like shunt capacitors of power factor correction. I'll show you today a power factor correction by a simple shunt capacitor connection, uh, connection is more risky at distribution level than what you would have thought it 10 years back. End users have an increased awareness of power quality issues and are challenging the utilities to improve the quality of power delivered. And many things are now interconnected in a network. Integrated process means that the failure of any component has much more important consequences. So there are power quality standards. I'm just naming a few. IEEE 519 is very uh, commonly followed in this country. We have other European standards, other IEEE standards. So there are uh, standards which we are expected to follow. And as we proceed, let us see what is the difference between a linear and a nonlinear load. A linear loads are those that generates a sinusoidal current waveform when fed from a sinusoidal voltage waveform. Examples are resistors, unsaturated inductors, and capacitors or their combination. Those elements which we teach in the class, upon which our students perform, uh, I mean, uh, calculations and solve problems. We assume a sinusoidal voltage to be applied, and the current is still the sinusoidal nature, whether I say resistance, inductance, capacitor, everything. But nonlinear loads are those that generates a non-sinusoidal current waveform 
when fed from a sinusoidal voltage waveform. Typical example is the diode rectifier. Even though we provide a sinusoidal voltage supply to the diode rectifier, the current that is drawn from the supply is not sinusoidal. It's a non-sinusoidal non waveform. So it's one of the biggest example of a nonlinear load and all power electronic load in essential are nonlinear and all power electronic sources that are connected to the grid are nonlinear. So somewhere we are running a risk at injecting harmonics and power factor correction problems. So what exactly what how do we proceed with this? Here we have a waveform which is definitely non sinusoidal is the input current of a three phase diode rectifier having a capacitor filter. But fortunately enough, today we know through the Fourier series analysis, we can express this into a series where we have a fundamental and the rest are harmonics. So the lowest frequency comp sine wave is the fundamental and all the other higher frequency sine waves are called as the harmonics. So this non-sinusoidal periodic waveform can be expressed as a series of sinusoidal frequency components. Good. So, and there may be a DC component also in this. How think of a half wave diode rectifier? A half wave diode rectifier has a DC component because the input current has only one half cycle. The other half cycle is not existing. So you have a DC component in the input AC line coming from the AC supply itself. So all can be present here literally. You can have DC component as well as harmonics. Let us see how they affect. First, let's start with what is power factor. In DC circuits, the average power can be calculated by DC voltage into DC current. I have used the word average current because there may be a fluctuation in current. So it's the product of the voltage and current in DC circuit that gives you the AC power. In AC circuit, it's not like that. So even if you multiply the RMS volts by RMS currents, you don't get power until you multiply it by another factor. And that factor is called as a power factor. Think of it once again. RMS voltage into RMS current multiplied by a factor gives you the average power that's consumed. So that factor is the power factor. So therefore, it's the factor by which the voltage and current has to be multiplied to get the true power. So using this equation, if I keep power factor on the left hand side, then my equation looks something like this. Power factor is the total power consumed divided by RMS volts and RMS amps. That is the definition of power factor, whether the waveforms are sinusoidal or non-sinusoidal. Now, if the let's go ahead with one more operation. This is a very elementary operation. Every engineer, electrical engineering student would have done in perhaps second or third year. I am using it as an example to portray something beyond. So here we have showing power consumption by a sinusoidal current with sinusoidal voltage of the same frequency. I have used both sine waves and same frequency. So I have a sinusoidal voltage. I have a sinusoidal current phase shifted. Multiply them. So simple math: small v is v m sine omega t, and small i is i m sine omega t minus theta. Instantaneous power is v into i. Works out to be this form, where this omega t and this omega t cancels. So we are left behind with Vm Im by 2 into cos theta minus a cosine term. If you look at this term carefully, you find that this is a constant value because theta was a constant value. So cos theta is constant. And this term has a double frequency component at twice omega t. So the actual waveform of small p will be like this. It will be a sinusoidal waveform at double the supply frequency with a DC shift upwards. This is the DC component added. If you take the average value of this waveform, logically, this term will remain because the average value of any sinusoidal or cosine waveform is zero because of the cancellation of the positive and the negative half cycles. That's exactly what happens when you take capital P as the average power, you take the average value and then it works out to VRMS, IRMS, cos theta. Good. So we know that in the case of sinusoidal current and voltage of same frequency, the power is expressed as VRMS, IRMS into cos theta. So we put it back into the expression of power factor and the power consumed is VRMS, IRMS cos theta. And remember in the denominator, we had VRMS into IRMS. So these cancels. And in this particular case where we have sinusoidal current and voltage of same frequency, power factor has the numerical value of cos theta. 
it is not the definition it is only the numerical value works out to be cos of theta and because theta can be related to angle you can talk in terms of lag or lead now we let's go ahead and see in case of non sinusoidal current and sinusoidal voltage what happens let us go back to the earlier slide for a moment and let us say that the voltage is sinusoidal but current is non sinusoidal so we have to apply superposition theorem and analyze every harmonic current by itself so i take the nth harmonic of current which will be n times here so it will be n omega t voltage is sin omega t but current will be having n omega t the moment this happens in this expression they will not cancel each other it will be omega t minus n omega t okay and it will not get cancelled so you will be left behind with two cosine terms if that happens when you take the average value the average value is going to be zero the average value of the case where you have a sine wave voltage with the nth harmonic current there is no power con steady power consumption by the current it cannot contribute to power consumption because the average value works out to be zero so now what happens is the rms current on the other hand has become large because of the addition of the dc and the, the other harmonics even if dc is not there the other harmonics have added on to the fundamental current but then we already know that it is only the fundamental current that can contribute to power the harmonics cannot contribute to power the dc cannot contribute to power it's even more easier to understand in case of dc because if this is the voltage and if the current is straight dc when you multiply it is just a question of scaling the um, sinusoidal waveform voltage into current because it's a waveform multiplied by a constant value so the average value is going to be zero so even if you have a dc component it cannot consume any average power so when you go to this expression you will understand that average power is consumed only by the fundamental component because they are of the same frequency i have assumed voltage to be sinusoidal that was my so far it is consistently my assumption voltage is sinusoidal and current is non sinusoidal so power is consumed only by the fundamental current and in the case the other harmonics have just made the rms value higher so with the ex earlier expression of total power consumed by rms volts and rms currents if i take two cases case number 1 when i had only fundamental current what is the power consumed that is at the numerator in case number 2 when fundamental current plus harmonics what is the power consumed it is still the same numerical value but in this case the rms amps magnitude has increased because of this case the denominator has increased power factor has reduced so therefore the presence of harmonics creates reduction in power factor it has nothing to do with the angle by basic definition of power factor it has reduced not related to angles so moment you have harmonics or dc components in the line current your power factor is going to reduce that simply means that your magnitude of current is much larger than what you could have managed because the fundamental is a sine wave you can now talk of an angle of displacement associated with that which we say as the displacement factor or that is cosine of theta 1 where theta 1 is the angle of displacement between the fundamental current and the sinusoidal voltage so displacement factor and power factor are not the same because in the presence of harmonics displacement factor may be unity which means the fundamental is in phase with the sinusoidal voltage but the power factor may be less than 1 because of the presence of harmonics so they are not the same so we have to be very careful about displacement factor and power factor okay. now we can combine these things together into the general expression like we know power factor is equal to this and so we know that is consumed uh, power is consumed only by fundamental so i put v1 i1 cos theta 1 i put v1 here because i have still assumed voltage to be sinusoidal there is no harmonic in the voltage by irms so the expression becomes i1 by irms cos theta 1 we already know cos theta 1 is displacement factor and i1 by irms can be expressed in terms of total harmonic distortion of the current 
which shows that I1 by I RMS can be expressed as 1 by root over 1 plus THD I square. THD I means the harmonic distortion in the current. So combining together total power factor is cos theta 1 divided by this this which shows that there are double effects on the power factor. If the fundamental current is having a displacement other than 0 degrees, then the power factor is going to be bad, which is, which is expressed in terms of the numerator. And if the current is going to have harmonics, then also the power factor is going to be bad, which is expressed in terms of the denominator. So both ways you will have a bad power factor. Now let us see what happens in the bus voltage. Suppose I have written this as a nonlinear. Suppose this was a linear load. Sources are mostly linear. They generate good sine waves. And this is the lumped impedance looking back from the bus. Suppose the load was linear. It would have been drawing a sinusoidal current from the sinusoidal voltage. So you would have got a sinusoidal voltage drop in the line impedance. So one sine wave of voltage here minus another sine wave of the voltage drop creates sine wave because a sine wave minus a sine wave is still a sine wave. Now if I have a nonlinear load here, it is drawing a non-sinusoidal current right through. So that voltage drop in the impedance is going to be non-sinusoidal. So a sine wave minus a non-sinusoidal waveform is going to be a non-sinusoidal waveform or rather a distorted sine wave. So the bus voltage here becomes a distorted sine wave now and everybody else connected to the bus starts seeing a distorted sine wave. So this is how the bus voltages are distorted because of nonlinear loads. This nonlinear load can be any power electronic equipment that is connected here. So this is a typical example of voltage distortion by a diode rectifier load. So you can see the voltage is clipped at the top. It's a distorted voltage waveform because the diode rectifier does not draw any current for this duration, neither does it draw for this duration, but for the middle in part of the half cycle, there is a huge drop of current. The current is achieves a large peak. So you can say in one way, simple way is that you, during this interval, you see the open circuit voltage. During this interval, you see the open circuit voltage and suddenly there is a huge current so that you see a sudden drop, but the voltage becomes distorted. Now, if the voltage is distorted, then even if you have resistive loads connected there, they will start drawing power because if the voltage and current are of the same frequency, there will be active power. That is exactly what we have proved in the earlier maths. I have said sinusoidal voltage and sinusoidal current of the same frequency. I didn't say what frequency, they have to be same. So if there is a harmonic component in the voltage and a harmonic component in the current of same frequency, there will be power consumption. How do we tackle this power problem, this harmonic problem? Our power electronic systems are injecting harmonics. So let's say we add a passive filter. This is a typical, very uh, popular type of filter. It's a shunt connected filter, which is series tuned. So L1 and C1 are tuned to some nth harmonic such that at the nth harmonic, the impedance is zero. And you remember that the load is creating the harmonic problem on current, the, not the source, the voltage was sine wave. So now just for the time being, forget about the existence of L2. So the load side harmonic current has two alternative paths to flow. Path number one, flowing back into the supply, crossing the supply's own source reactance, which will now be n times larger because of the nth harmonic, or it will try to flow a, a ideal zero impedance through this path. In real life, we know it will not be zero. It will be residual resistance, but let's say it will be very low impedance. Obviously, most of the harmonics will flow through this and not flow backwards. So therefore, if they are not flowing back, then the line becomes free of that harmonic all the harmonics will be circulating within this itself. This is a good solution. And plus you have an added advantage now. This type of LC circuit at fundamental frequency behaves like a capacitance because you will recall that any LC series tuned circuit below its resonant frequency behaves like a capacitor. And the fundamental here is below the nth resonant frequency, nth harmonic resonant frequency. So, it will behave like a capacitor, which means it will add to VAR compensation. 
addition it will be like you have a additional capacitor here it will add to the var compensation requirement at this location so it's good double way why do we have this value l2 it is because it is not a real part of the filter i have put in this lc tunes filter at my premises such that hardly any harmonic current is getting injected onto the line but if my next door neighbor he has certain amount of non linear loads then those harmonic currents for him will have two paths path number 1 to flow into the supply system with the impedance being n times larger at the nth harmonic or option number 2 in the absence of l2 those currents can flow into my system because this is going to show zero impedance if those harmonic currents are flowing into my system load into my um, premises then the metering wearing is again going to show a large content of harmonic current here and i have a distorted current at the input side now the current is actually not because of my load but it's because of the so called import of harmonics from external sources it creates a lot of problem not only in terms of harmonic losses at the input it also creates problem in terms of overloading of these filters because they will be designed for a particular magnitude of harmonic current if additional harmonic is coming in the current capacity has to be enhanced so what we do is we put a series choke here which is also called as the detuning choke so that if the current tries to flow into my premise then it will see a n times l2 reactance here now a reactance proportional to n times of l2 so that it will not be very easy for all those harmonic currents to flow into my premises so this is more of a detuning choke rather than a part of the filter you can also have a series connected parallel tuned harmonic filters if you have a parallel tuned lc at nth harmonic then the impedance becomes zero which means the harmonic is not permitted to flow through it that is good another alternative way but the problem is that the entire load current has to be carried by this filter which was not the case in the earlier system because only the harmonic current was carried by the filter so therefore most of the time we prefer the shunt connected filter rather than the series connected filter the only disadvantage is you have to put one filter of each type for every harmonic frequency for example if you need fifth harmonic you'll put one for fifth if you need seventh harmonic you need one for seventh and so on and for three phase systems you have everything multiplied by 3 now let's come back and see what happens if i try to put a capacitor across the lines in the presence of a harmonic source like what i have shown here so this is my system model earlier system model where i have the sinusoidal supply its own reactance supply reactance this is my pcc this is the harmonic source my converter which is injecting harmonics into the line and i have just added a resistive load and i decide to improve upon the power factor by putting a capacitor i can have multiple thoughts a capacitor connection here will permit part of the harmonics to flow through this so it will not flow back into the supply your supply is going to be n times excess and this will be xc by n divided by n i my understanding is by putting a capacitor here all the harmonics will flow here and not necessarily flow back to the source so the source line will become free of harmonics this is on one concept from by which i am putting the capacitor second concept might be that i want to improve power factor let us see what happens now the same circuit if i have to analyze at the kth harmonic frequency to which i am talking about this is a kth harmonic source then this source has to be represented by thevenin's equivalent this is a fundamental frequency so at the kth harmonic equivalent circuit this source has to be short circuited and this reactance has to be made k times excess that's what we have made k times of omega ls omega 1 ls and the voltage source has become shorted and then we have the harmonic source the capacitance and the load resistance which you can transform into this simple solution this is the same they are both the same if you look carefully you have a parallel connected l and c here and if by chance the l and c resonance resonate that means they goes into parallel resonance then the 
in impedance created by them will be infinitely large, but the currents through each will be complementary to each other and can have a large magnitude. So therefore, there can be a large circulating current within the parallel connected LC if they go into a parallel resonance system. Under the situation, you look at take a look at the phasor diagram. ISN, the current flowing through this reactance, is quite large, which is the same as ICN, which is quite large, but phase opposition. So overall current is getting cancelled, but there is a circulating current within them. One is positive, one is negative. And this is the source current IN, which is flowing through the resistance load. Now you see what actually is this reactance. This reactance is nothing but the source reactance, which means you have a large current now circulating between the source and the capacitor, the large harmonic current circulating between the source and the capacitance. And by putting the capacitor, the input current THD has actually increased instead of getting reduced. Your argument was this should have been the lower impedance. The, whatever harmonic was flowing in the line should have got reduced, but now you find it has actually increased. And that is because unknowingly you have made a resonance situation with the uh, source side reactance and your capacitor. So you must be very, very careful when you put the capacitor. It should not go into uh, resonance with the source. You don't know the source reactance. So you have to make an estimate and observe and work very carefully without going into resonance. Otherwise, the, actually the input harmonic current will increase. And second thing is the total current through the capacitor is also going to increase. Increased current through capacitor creates dielectric losses. You have heard something called as tan delta in the capacitor. There is a loss. So more current means more losses in the capacitor. Its temperature will rise and will ultimately fail. So this is what you have to be very careful about. So there are differences between import of harmonics and resonance with source reactances. In both cases, the source current harmonic increases, but in the case of import of harmonics, the harmonic currents are flowing in and through the shunt capacitor due to import coming from another source of harmonic currents and not the sinusoidal supply. Whereas in the case of harmonic currents flowing in through the shunt capacitor due to resonance, the source, uh, the harmonic current frequency comes from the sinusoidal supply itself and not from another harmonic source. There is a distinction between the two, but the end results will be similar. <coughs> Sorry, now we come to what is VAR. You are familiar with already this triangle. I don't have to explain. It is a reactive power. Apparent power was volts into amps and true power was volt amps into power factor. Or if a sinusoidal waveforms, you say multiplied by cos theta. But reactive power exclusively is still defined in terms of sinusoidal components. So it is VA into sine theta. Sinusoidal components here means theta will be the angle between the fundamental component of current and the voltage. We do not talk much about distortion in voltage because voltage distortion most of the time is less than 3%, which is quite small, but the current distortion can achieve very large magnitudes. So therefore, I have taken an example of voltage and current displaced by 90 degrees intentionally so that there is no active power involved. and Everything is reactive power. And when you plot instantaneous voltage into current, you find that is expressed in the blue line, which shows an equal area between the positive and negative half cycles, so that the average power transferred during this process is zero. You don't have any average power transferred, but you have something called as a reactive power. So therefore, the line current is made higher by the presence of reactive power than what would have been active power alone. Now let us see active power and reactive power in three phase systems. Instantaneous power in three phase is the summation of the three phase power, which we have already seen there was a constant term and a cosine term in the when we have derived out the maths in the case of a single phase. So we put a sum of all these two, three, and then the constant term summation three times means it becomes three times, okay? three times of the constant term and the cosine term. If I sum it up, three cosine waveforms displaced by exactly 120 degrees 
sum up to zero. If you take individual magnitude at, at any instant, here it is positive, and this is two times of 50% negative, so it cancels. At any time, the summation is zero. So therefore, this summation in three phase becomes zero. It becomes three times of the uh, constant term, so you get a particular magnitude. And that is a steady, because it's a constant term, it is a steady time invariant X waveform of power. That is why in a three phase machine, you get three, uh, steady torque. You don't get a fluctuating torque because power of curve in three phase is steady. So torque becomes steady. However, when you talk about three phase reactive power flow, if you sum it up, sum the three phase reactive power expressions, the summation is zero because on an average, there is no reactive power flow. If you see the last curve, average value is zero. And what happens is that when you sum it up, it becomes zero it implies that where is it summed up in the inverter, our solar inverter system. The load can have reactive power from the inverter system. The reactive power will flow. The currents will be larger in magnitude because of reactive power. But when you are summing it up at the input of the cap uh, inverter system, the reactive power total content becomes zero. Physically, it means that the reactive power drawn by one phase is being supplied from the other two phases and there is no real exchange of power from the DC side. Because DC side, there is no concept of reactive power. It's only active power. Of course, you can send power to the DC side and take back power once again, such that the average power transfer is zero. That is what happens in a single phase system. In a single phase inverter system, the reactive power flow makes the part of the energy flow back to the DC side. And again, that exact amount of energy will flow back to the load. So when we say reactive power, that is the amount of power that circulates between the source and the load. In the case of the inverter, the source is the DC source. So that in single phase, that power goes back to DC and has to flow out from the DC once again. That is why no inverter can be built without a capacitor on its DC bus because the DC source might be coming from a non-returnable source like a diode rectifier. Energy cannot flow back into a diode rectifier, so I must have a capacitor on the input of the inverter so which can absorb the reactive power in one half cycle and send out the reactive power in the other half cycle in single phase. But in three phase, there is nothing that will flow into the capacitor because the summation is shown to be zero. See three single phase as waveforms displaced by 120 and same magnitude sums to zero so that in three phase, it does not even enter that capacitor even if the capacitor is there. So therefore in three phase systems, the sizing of the capacitor is much smaller than in single phase systems. Okay. Why power electronics is now being applied to control of harmonics and VAR instead of passive systems to compensate for harmonic currents generated by nonlinear loads. It has the ability to supply leading as well as lagging VAR, high speed compensation, smooth stepless operation, no moving parts, higher efficiency. And we have VAR compensators in the form of fixed capacitor banks, which is in today's power electronics activity becoming a bit, a bit risky. We have synchronous condensers, rotating machines, overexcited, which provide the amount of uh, VAR required. And we have distribution static compensators or DSTATCOMs, which I'm going to talk about. This is an example of worst condition where the in, this is a phase control rectifier input current. It's a flat topped current which gets shifted on the right hand side away from the zero crossing of the voltage depending on that firing angle of the converter. So therefore, in this case, as I change or increase the firing angle, power factor is degraded because of the displacement of the fundamental current. That is number one. Number two is because there is already a lot of harmonics in this, typically 33% harmonic is there. That is the second cause of degradation of power factor. So therefore, in case of phase control rectifier inputs, the power factor is going to be one of the worst and it's going to vary depending on the firing angle utilized. So therefore, phase control rectifiers are being slowly phased out of operation for anything below 10 kilowatts of power and switch mode converters are ta over ta I mean, taking over. 
phase control rectifiers are still existing and large power rating because of their reliability in the large power applications, but certain techniques are involved to make the power factor close to unity. You cannot make it unity, it's close to unity and reduction in current distortions. Of course, one process is the multi pulse rectifier or multi phase rectifier, as we can say, because where we have, as an example, two transformers giving a mutual 30 degree phase shift between them. Then the currents on the input sides have 30 degree phase shift between them. And with 30 degree phase shift, the fifth and the seventh harmonic components of current gets canceled. So therefore, you have an input current which is de devoid of fifth and seventh harmonic currents. It looks like a stepped wave form and therefore you have less total harmonic distortion. So you have lesser power factor involved in the input side. Uh, however, you need transformers. So you need a bulky component for doing this, achieving this target. So instead of that, what we try to achieve is achieve a sinusoidal input current in phase with the voltage. And as an example, I have selected a voltage waveform. I will try to achieve or synthesize a current which has the same zero crossings at the same instance and a wave shape that is close to this voltage waveform. In that case, I would, would have achieved with near unity power factor in the input because the current fundamental will be in phase. The total amount of harmonics will be low, so it will be near unity power factor. Nothing is really unity power factor. Near unity is the best you can say. 99.6%, whatever you say, it's, that's near unity. How do we do it? One of the most primitive solutions today that we study, is very important to study, is this type of active power factor technology. Originally, we had diode rectifiers with capacitors connected to the output, and they had drawn non-sinusoidal currents. So somebody had a bright idea that you don't put a capacitor or the load directly at the output of the diode rectifier, but you put a boost converter in between, and you connect the load and the capacitor on the output side. So now what happens is, if this is the input supply, and if I assume that this is the input supply which I'm monitoring, although it is a rectified supply, for a half cycle, my logic holds true. So for the first half cycle, this is the input supply voltage waveform. There is no capacitor here. The voltage waveform is monitored, used as the template. The actual current is monitored, and the dotted line here is the template. So it monitors if the current is below the template, it turns on the switch. By turning on the switch, you have short circuited the input supply through the reactance or the inductance, and the current starts building up into the switch. So this is the rise of current that you find at that time. The current rises up. Now you monitor that the peak of the current has gone well above my accepted value beyond my mean value. So you take the logical decision and turn off the switch. The moment the switch turns off, there is a current already flowing in the inductor. Energy is stored half Li square. So by Lenz's law, the right hand side becomes plus and the current continues to flow out through the uh, diode into the load side. And therefore, the <coughs> energy content in the inductor starts coming down because energy is half Li square. So current starts coming down. And then again, your monitoring system warns you that the current has come quite below or significantly below my mean value as decided by the template. So you close the switch once again. So you, in this process, by turning on the switch and turning it off, you are creating a rise and a fall in the inductor current, and you are making that inductor current follow the half cycle, for, uh, follow the template, voltage template for the half cycle. The voltage is assumed to be sinusoidal. The template gives you the frequency, very simple technique. You'll be able to follow like this. And so for the next half cycle. Although here I have shown that I'm monitoring the DC bus voltage, the current on the input side at any instant is the same as the DC current because there is no parallel path in between. So it's the same. So input current will be almost sinusoidal like this in both the half cycles. Now we have the diode to prevent the capacitor from discharging into the switch when the switch is turned on. So that's a blocking diode. And second thing is, the output voltage is always higher than the peak of the highest AC supply voltage. 
because then only if this voltage is higher than the peak of the supply, then these four diodes will be reverse biased naturally. If they are naturally reverse biased, then only this system can work. Otherwise, if the voltage is held less than the peak of the supply, these diodes will have a tendency to conduct naturally, uh, which will make the input current uh, non sinusoidal and beyond your control. So that is why this voltage has to be higher than the peak of the input supply. So this is the type of waveform we can get using the template. Now we are trying to modify that concept into another type of converter where we put four switches across the four diodes and we shift the DC bus inductance to the AC side. Can we achieve the same thing? Let's see. For the positive half cycle of supply, when the top part is positive, I close switch S4 such that current flows through the switch S4 down through switch S2 diode and back. So I have created a short circuit here. Energy starts building up here. When I open switch S4, this energy by Lenz's law creates a kick to flow from the right hand side, flows through the diode, back through this diode and back here. So therefore energy stored in the inductor would have now gone to the DC side, capacitor, resistance, whatever is there on that side. So for the positive half cycle, I have demonstrated it is possible. Let's consider the negative half cycle when this is positive. At that time, switch S2 when it is closed will create a short circuit. And when you open switch S2, the trapped energy will give a kick on the left hand side. The current will flow like this through diode D3 back here and through diode D4 and flow backwards so that the current rise and fall will be almost the same nature as what you had found in the earlier case. So you will be a practically be able to create this type of a waveform where the current is rising up and going down. So you have still achieved the target of trying to track the template in the other case, second case also. Whereas in the second case, you'll find that the inductor is on the AC side and have put four, four switches across that four diodes. Question might arise, why do I put four switches across the diode? It seems I can achieve the target using two switches only. Yes, you are correct. It can be achieved by using only two switches, but putting four switches changes that to topology totally. If I put four switches here, Take a fresh look at this structure. It is nothing but a single phase H bridge inverter. So if this becomes an inverter, then the whole system behaves, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry, whole system behaves as a bidirectional active power factor corrected converter through which power can flow either from the DC side to AC side or from the AC side to DC side, both ways. So power flow can be achieved both ways. So it becomes a bidirectional converter. If I'm sending power from the AC side to DC side, then this is my boost inductor for boosting up the voltage to match the required DC voltage from the AC side. And if I'm sending power from the DC side to AC side, this inductor is for limiting the circulating harmonic currents. Why? Because you'll realize this waveform is a pulse width modulated waveform, something like this. And this waveform is a sine wave. So even when this waveform has a zero magnitude here, there is a finite magnitude of voltage existing. So if the inductor is not there, there will be a direct short circuit and a heavy current flow between the two. So the inductor serves as the harmonic current limiting reactor or current limiting reactor for this structure. And it has a dual function. And this is the way the bidirectional active power converter operates. So you can have a solar system on this side and this is your grid. So from the solar system, you can feed power back into the grid. You can see the input, the controls are usually sinusoidal PWM type. So the AC side voltage will look something like this and the AC side current will appear like this, a zigzag zigzag type of current. Sinusoidal pulse width modulation, I don't have to explain. You have pulse widths which are proportional to the sign of their position and you can create them by the conventional sign triangle comparison or you can create them by writing any type of software that you want. We can have three phase bidirectional power converters also extend the same concept to three phase. This is how the power is transferred. 
if I'm going through a rectifier operation where I assume that there is a load on the DC side, maybe a battery which I'm charging from the grid, then the rectifier operation, I have a choice. What shall be the power factor on the supply side? This is the V is the supply side voltage. What shall be the power factor on the supply side? Most of the time we choose it to be unity because then the current involved is the minimal. If I choose the current to be unity at unity power factor, then the phasor diagram shows the fundamental current to be in phase with the supply voltage, which means the reactance drop shall be vertically upwards because the current shall lag the voltage. This is the voltage current is lagging. It shall be vertically upwards. So summation shows what shall be the magnitude of the induced fundamental voltage to be created here by the use of sinusoidal pulse width modulation. So using sinusoidal pulse width modulation, you are to create a fundamental voltage having a magnitude of E and a phase displacement of this as shown here. So you need a phase locked loop on this side to find out the zero crossing of the voltage and thereafter create a voltage, fundamental voltage of this magnitude and this much displacement, then the system will keep operating as you had desired. In case you want to send power from this side to the grid, like as, as in a solar photovoltaic case, the situation is reversed. The current is going to be displaced by 180 degrees. So the corresponding position of the reactance drop will change. So the position of induced voltage to be created here has to change. And that is what you will try to synthesize here through the sinusoidal pulse width modulation control of the converter. And the whole process becomes something like this, which is analogous to what you have in a synchronous generator system. Synchronous machine rather, I can say. It becomes analogous to that. You have a process that reactance that you have there is equivalent to the synchronous reactance in a synchronous machine, and you can have an exchange of power in the direction that you want. The line currents will behave like this, little zigzag, zigzag, but with a small amount of filter, you can have a very good sinusoidal current, low total harmonic distortion of current. Now something interesting arises. The template in the earlier case was sinusoidal and locked in phase to a particular voltage, whether it's a zero crossing of in phase with a zero displacement or a finite displacement is our choice because we wanted power to flow back at unity power factor. But there are conditions in these bidirectional converters where there will not be any exchange of average power on the DC side. Number one condition is the most simplest to understand. That is when the voltage and currents are of same frequency but displaced by 90 degrees. With a 90 degree displacement, you know that no active power can be transferred. Then why do we do it? We can send act reactive power. The whole converter will behave as a source of reactive power now. Suppose this converter is connected to the grid. This can handle reactive power and it is up to you to make the converter with the current lagging or leading so that it depends what type of var you are trying to compensate. That is your control totally. Now, if there, it is exactly 90 degrees, there is no exchange of average power. So it implies that there is no need of energy source or energy receiver on the DC side and a simple capacitor charge up to the requisite DC voltage will be sufficient for the operation neglecting circuit losses. So your converter does not need a source on that side. So in other words, if, I, if this was my solar photovoltaic panel supplying power to the grid and during nighttime operation, I do not have any source of power, but I have a capacitor on this DC bus. This can act as a source of static VAR compensation because it can inject <coughs> either a leading or a lagging current into the line, depending on the template that I'm forming. So therefore your solar inverter at any time of the day can create a combination of active and reactive power. It's becoming more and more powerful the way we look at it. Even if you don't have solar energy available, you can use it as a reactive source, power source to adjust or to maintain the voltage levels at the distribution points. The second is when the AC supply voltage is sinusoidal and the current is sinusoidal, but at harmonic frequency. If my template is made to at harmonic frequency, we have seen that the harmonics cannot have any average power exchange 
so there is no exchange of average power so therefore with a simple capacitor i can still inject harmonic currents into the line how does it help we have something called as a active power filter suppose this is a supply line, uh, generating source with the source impedance and this is my load which was generating harmonic so i was drawing a distorted current and therefore resulted in a distorted voltage at this bus now i inject harmonic current into this point through a so called active power filter which is nothing but the same uh, bidirectional converter with a capacitor connection connected to the grid where i monitor what is the current flowing through in this bus and i duplicate the same current here with a 180 degree phase shift such that the current drawn by this load is actually supplied from this here so that the resulting current disappears from this bus so here it becomes fundamental current only and therefore it goes back to a sinusoidal voltage because harmonics are not there so harmonic drops disappear they become a sinusoidal voltage once again so all its harmonic current is supplied by the so called active power filter and the benefit here over passive filters is you do not have any resonance problems because you are not using any direct inductance or capacitor connected across the lines second thing is you don't have to operate harmonic by harmonic fifth seventh individually like in a passive filter here you can have the composite harmonic distorted waveform as the template and you can inject the same distorted template current here you don't have to find out exactly which is how much composite template will do so you monitor the total current subtract the fundamental whatever is the remaining shall be your template here and it keeps operating so this is an example of active power filter this was the original current waveform for the rectifier load here and this is the harmonic current injected from this harmonic active power filter and you can see the resultant current has become quite sinusoidal nearly sinusoidal here we can use this system now as a statcom where the template will be sinusoidal at fundamental frequency but displaced by 90 degrees and as i have explained earlier also it can keeps connected to the grid and supply reactive power either lagging or leading with a quick response and you need to have a capacitor only the catch here is the the system is not ideal there are losses in the system which will drain out energy in the capacitor both in this as well as the active power filter so what you have to do is you have to ensure a little bit of fundamental current flow into this to maintain the bus voltage if you are able to maintain the bus voltage to the required value then your operation continues so from the grid you have to draw a little bit of power to maintain that bus voltage that is the catch so with this i think i come to almost the end of my oh no a little bit more we can quickly go through it we i think we are running short of time we still have time the future is going into multi level inverters and converters because as i mentioned we do not have adequate voltage rating of devices to connect for the high vo voltage buses the tendency today is to go in for multi level inverters and converters where this is a schematic representation only each in structure converter structure operates with a individual cell voltage but the outputs are all connected in series to achieve a high voltage to at the output so you can see the total voltage that is created comprises of smaller steps that had been contributed by the individual inverters and each step comprises of this dc bus voltage so each individual devices are rated at lower voltage but the composite waveform is a higher voltage here so this is one technique to connect uh, the Uh, devices having lower bus voltage to a higher grid voltage when you take a look at a closer look at the system between the ordinary and the multi level basically two level and the multi level inverter there are certain turners other points that you'll find apart from the voltage that you see you can see this is cutting down to zero during the positive half cycle here you will not see it cutting down to zero a magnitude is one per unit but here it is cutting down 50% here it's cutting down only 50% so the dv by dt created by the inverter is only 50% of what was here plus you get more fundamental because this is a rock solid area nothing has been cut out from this area so you get higher fundamental also 
Therefore, certain other advantages do arise. Your insulation systems of the transformers and other systems are less stressed because of lower dV by dt. You get higher fundamental. And so, as I have already mentioned, devices of lower ratings can be used. Leads to lower, lower total harmonic distortion in voltage, lower dV by dt, and lower switching frequency is effective. And hence, there is an actual reduction in switching losses. Because you can see in the earlier one here, this device does not switch at all here. It is off when this switches. So effectively, and the magnitude of switching is also of lower magnitude, which you have seen from this graph. So therefore, switching losses do reduce in a multi-level converter system. There are problems that are to be overcome. The number of isolated DC links are apparently more. You can have single DC link, but you need certain balancing algorithms to it. Power bus structure becomes more complex, and there is some decrease in the reliability. So with that, I come to an end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. Thank you so much for being here and for such an informative session. So participants, if any queries, please ask. Hello. Yes, please. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Uh, good morning, please, sir. sir. Good morning. Yeah. Yes, sir. My name is Ardhik M. Pandya from Gujarat. Yes, please. Sir, I would like to ask you about the uh, basic difference between standalone inverters and battery operated inverters because standalone system do involve a battery, right? Obviously. And how can yes. we discriminate the battery operated inverters as compared to standalone inverters? Uh, I really don't know what exactly is a battery operated. We know standalone inverters, yes, where we have a battery backup and we have the inverter operating to supply the local, as we call it, local load. Means just as individual, some specific load is the term. Jargon is local load, that's all. But I don't know what is a battery operated inverter. I think it's the same, but I'm not very sure because I haven't heard that battery operated inverter. In UPS systems, yes, you always have a battery, but I'm not sure what you're referring to. Standalone, yes, what I said is correct. Okay. And what okay. you also, I think, you understand that is correct. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sir. It's not connected to the grid. That's that's the meaning of standalone inverter. Not connected to the grid, but it will supply in a local load. And if you have that uh, other one with a battery backup, then it can be connected to the grid, and it will also have a battery backup system. Yeah, sir, out can of you the three types. Yes, please. Tell me. Okay. Uh, would you uh, provide some insight about the bidirectional meters that has been installed in rooftop plant? Okay, bidirectional metering are installed for, uh, see, basically it's a um, monopoly are controlled by the power distribution uh, operators because they their version is that we have invested in the network and we maintain the network, so it is our property. We are here to sell the power and not to buy power. So this has been the controversy. And as you would have noticed earlier, government had given us rate of power being bought back, the difference was large. Selling power from the utility and the buying back rate was large. Today, the difference has reduced to very, very small magnitude because of yeah. several other such difficulties raised by the operators. And they are reluctant, or rather avoiding, shall I use the word appropriately, to give bi-directional metering system to the individual consumers. They are providing to institutional consumers. There is one more aspect to this uh, story also. You have to look at it from a different side. Suppose today all the houses, let's say in my small locality, have rooftop solar and they all are feeding power into the grid. One aspect is commercial where the grid is not really able to send any power to my area because everybody is generating and, and his power is not being bought. So what does he do with that excess power? He has to sell it off somewhere. He's running a business. He has to sell it. <clears throat> so he cannot cut down on his generation capacity because the moment there is a cloud burst over my locality, all that solar input is going to go off. And then I will blame him that the power has an outage. He cannot turn off his generators. 
and start the generator immediately. At the most, if he had a power backup system like a big battery installation, a storage system, he could have managed. So that's why I said that you have to look at the other side of the story and try to understand what's happening. And at the same time, a lot of power suddenly going off because of a cloud burst, no sunlight, will create instability in the power system also. You will have a sudden difference in power flow from both sides, instability, oscillations. These are also the risks involved. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. Right. Uh, hello, sir. This is Monica from Bangalore. Yes, please. Uh, sir, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You are audible, madam. Please go ahead. I don't know. Uh, are, are the are others able to hear? I can. I am not able to hear. Uh, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yes, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, I just wanted to ask about. Uh, I mean, you are talking about a multi-level converter. Yes, uh, please. Of course, with the challenges, if I consider a resonant uh, converter for multi-level, in and uh, consider in multi-level design. What could be the challenges that I could actually face? Uh, nothing other than the usual, except that depends on the load. Your resonant converter systems will be in a way depending on the load. So you have to take care of that. I don't know. I have not worked in resonant converter application to multi-level. I don't know. I can't tell you firsthand of any specific problems there. But we have worked on multi-level in converter systems, not uh, application of resonance there. But I guess it would depend on the load because you have to have a reson path created somehow there. And that current is load current dependent. That's all I can say. I'm not an expert in that particular area. OK, anyway, thank you, sir. Right. So I guess anybody no more else queries, uh, I guess uh, no more queries. So uh, thank you okay. again, sir, for clarifying the queries of participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. So participants, you. please you, do sir. not leave. Please do not leave. There is a break of five minutes. After that, uh, our next speaker will join. Thank you.